Okay. Hey, hey, I'm talking crusty. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, we're talking Chapo. We're talking Chapo this week. It's your Chapo. It's your will. It's me talking to you. Uh, before we start the show, just a little brief house cleaning on an issue that I know you guys are interested in. I'm talking about merch. And if you're listening to this right now, I'm going to let you know that you will be given a special opportunity in the show information of this very episode you're listening to to purchase the latest run of Chapo Trap House t-shirts. We did it uh, last time for the election show. A lot of people were, where's my t-shirt? Where's my t-shirt? There just weren't enough. Now is your opportunity to get more t-shirts. Or, and you can also come out on Friday to our Bastille Day show that uh, Phil, Matt and I are doing with Jacobin. T-shirts are also be for sale there. Information in the show info. Yeah, uh, we got those ones. We got uh, alternative fa- alternative facts equals the wall just got ten lies higher. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, <laughs> I am I am stringent in saying that because kafifi or whatever is not a word, you, there is no correct spelling of it. But I do know that kafefe, which Will just said, is not the correct spelling. Oh, no matter shut what. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rip it up. And I was going to say, uh, you know, start this exercise by uh, a little recap of uh, Contract to a Kill. Um, <laughs> you sat on it for a few hours. Uh, it's a, it's a, you need to let it, it, motherfuckers like to call Contract to Kill. <laughs> you need to let it digest. It's like any great meal. You can't immediately say what you think about it. Mm-hmm. You know? I'm Anything not going to be like shitting that. out this particular sirloin for at least a week. Except it's those noodles that are made of that mushroom that contain no calories. So you just... You just eat them to fill up, but they have no nutritional value at all. I don't know yeah. about you, but I feel very nu- nutritionally enriched by this film. <laughs> I learned a lot about the, about the dangers of the Mexican border, uh, why we need a wall. To Turkey. It's actually the Turkish-Syrian yeah. border Tur- in that yeah. movie. <laughs> wait a minute. Turkish, wait, no, wait a minute. Wait, 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 they were border. smuggling him from Mexico, too. Yeah. You know, the whole movie took place in, in Istanbul. Yeah, but they kept going to yeah, Sonora. They, they literally... Yeah, no, it's I'm, the U.S. border. Okay, how, so how, how drunk were you, Will? Yeah, you're too drunk. You well, no, I mean like they, they were going to sneak people across the U.S. Mexican border, but like that didn't prevent the movie from taking place entirely in Turkey. No, it wasn't no, entirely it didn't in Turkey. He literally they, had, he was in Mexico for the first two. No, seasons. you guys were drunk. I read no, this movie I, correctly. No, I, no. The only it's location had, in this you movie, the only drunk was person, on the absolutely border incorrect. And grilling in the a guy very beginning, in, a, in the very very beginning, that was. That, a, that was the, yes, that's the that's, porter that they've been talking yes. about. Steven, you're tearing us apart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we saw we saw a contract. We saw a motherfucking contract to kill. Contract to kill starring Steven Seagal. It's one of his late period movies. And you know how we've talked about how he's becoming increasingly slow and his coats are becoming increasingly bigger? <laughs> well, I don't know if the coats can get any bigger if he could talk any slower than he did in this one, or <laughs> this if the plot could be any more he confusing. He can't get any bronzer. That's this one was, uh, I just, yeah, I, I, him and Cake Boss. Yeah. I didn't think, guy. I didn't think he could sound more like being on Quaaludes than any of the previous <laughs> oh, yeah. movies, but like it's gotten worse. He's even more chopped and screwed yeah. than he, he was before. Yeah, so <laughs> so at, the be- at the beginning, they do the scene in every Seagal movie where, like, a guy, a guy who's like, "Yeah, I'm a t- secret agent from the government in- intelligence bureau," uh, is li- and he, he talks to he meets Seagal in like some bar, and he goes, uh, "You're actually you've never lost a fight." You made every gunshot you've ever made. Every woman wants to have sex with you. Everyone thinks you're cool, including the terrorists, the drug dealers, and the government. So can you do this op for me? And in every movie, Seagal goes, I'm going to tell you one motherfucking thing. <laughs> we going to do this my way. And what that always means is that this mission is going to be 90% him sitting in yeah. a car. <laughs> yeah. Not yes. even and driving. There was, there's, Seagal is not an active man these it's days. It's amazing. So he, he has several f- uh, fights in which it's like his body doubles back and then cut to him punching at the screen. <laughs> 
Like there's yeah. a person there cut back to his body double. And then one scene where he shot some people. But in that scene, <laughs> he shot them from the front seat of the car he was driving. <laughs> he didn't well, even get out of the he car. He made some shots at one point and then advanced up the stairs like a shuffling old man worried about leaking <laughs> urine. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, yeah. the novelty. Like it was a prostate problem <laughs> shuffle. <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing, okay, uh, the plus of this movie is that it did feature quite a lot of Seagal, unlike, let's say, The Asian Connection or, or The, the Perfect, Perfect Weapon, Weapon where mm-hmm. Seagal is basically the villain of the movie that just appears in like maybe 10 minutes of screen time to yeah. just. Yeah, there's a lot of Seagal. In philosophically yeah. and touch women it, awkwardly. And in those decide it, that he like just refuses to shoot unless they come to his house now? Yeah. Yeah, like, because yeah. it's like the same like. Like We've Minsk noticed, yeah. mansion yeah. that we there think is, is just his. There is a location sh- uh, in this movie that was like the main like drug dealers hangout that was recycled probably thirty times in in this film. But we, you I know, because we're yeah. Seagal, you it's, know, completists, we've realized yeah. that this same building was used in several. Yeah. Of his it's other obviously movies. his fuck dacha outside Murmansk. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, we want to make clear this is in the there are two categories. Yeah, the villain Seagal and the hero Seagal. And the villain Seagal does things the real Steven Seagal would never do, like traffic women, <laughs> have sex slaves, <laughs> just say, say confusing shit that goes nowhere. This where, one had I mean, a really awful moment where, you know, we all know about his penchant for sitting awkwardly and having <laughs> his, you know, having a naked woman bestride him. Uh, but this time, I really felt like I wanted to call the cops <laughs> on <laughs> behalf of this poor woman who got sh- topless and then had him like listlessly. Boot-throw. Paw her tits for like ten minutes. It's like we oh, saw this too poor much of that. Woman. He like he full on just squeezed. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was squeezing the Charmin, and it, it was and, and imagine, imagine a woman like in her like uh, you know in her twenties yeah. or whatever in a lingerie reclining naked on a bed, <laughs> lying next to a man wearing a black leather jacket the size of a tarp, yeah. fully clothed. <laughs> Pawing her her breasts. Yeah, it was yeah. it was disgusting. Yeah, I, I I demand an Interpol <laughs> investigation. I need to know where that woman is now. Could you uh, d- uh, could you take some of my natural juices from the pan that I'm laying <laughs> in and baste my torso, please? This no. is a little motherfucking thing we like to call au jus. <laughs> now the other the other thing that we noticed about this movie is that. Okay, unlike the other the, the 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 main Seagal movies like Good Man, Mercenary Absolution, or some of the other action movies where he's not just sort of the villain behind the scenes, where he takes a more shall we say active role in, in the very film. generous <laughs> use yeah, of the term, yeah. is that in those movies usually he has a sidekick who's a much younger <laughs> man who does almost all of the action and fighting scenes himself because you know like. He, the, the, it's sort of like his stunt double. I but like trying to get off of this hemorrhoid pillow. Sorry. In, in this movie, they sort of have that, but like it's a guy who's slightly younger than him, but not really. It, who just uh, does? The, oh, Asian Kyle McLaughlin. He's yeah. Like, Kind, he might be his age, but he just took care of himself. Yeah, he's a yeah. more well-preserved version. Yeah, he didn't eat Auntie Anne's hot dog pretzels <laughs> every day for like 20 years. <laughs> but this yeah, guy just did, like, uh, Kyle instead of doing fight, this guy did a little fighting, but he mainly just did drone remote control. <laughs> yeah. yeah, That was like, his role. Lot, in the there's a lot of drones in this movie. tech into a movie for a very low cost, I mean, you know this is like a $200 Walmart drone yeah. that they use. Mm-hmm. And they put like a plastic gun in like a wind and then f- put like CGI flash to make it look like it was shooting. Yeah, it's the, sh- the shooter copter. Yeah, yeah. really bad. Uh, okay. I, I, hey, motherfucker, I'm just, uh, you're not for me, but uh, for my friend, is there any way your drone can go unnoticed into uh, uh, Forever 21 dressing room? <laughs> You know, just for, you know, if we needed to do an op there. <laughs> this one motherfucker is called Reconnaissance. I mean, to me, like, since we've been watching these movies, like, to me, like, and, and this movie really pushed it to a, a new limit that I didn't think was possible. Uh, watching these movies, it, it's, they're surreal. They're surreal and <laughs> subversive of the whole medium of film because you watch them and things happen and it just sort of washes over you and you're like 45 minutes into the movie and then you realize you don't know Anything that has happened, no, no. Yeah. like you don't know what the plot is. Towards like, you, the like, end, we were it's like, just, where, yeah, where, who 
are these people? Yeah. Why it's, are they there? It's experimental filmmaking in that, like, they fill <laughs> an hour and a half you of. You feel like you're sundowning with Alzheimer's. <laughs> yeah, 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 but, like, well, nothing makes happens. question reality. <laughs> yeah. And it ended in the most avant garde way a Steven mm, Seagal yeah. movie has ever <laughs> ended. So he kills, one of the two, he kills one of the bad guys after doing one of those, like, I'm not actually going to fight because I fought for two minutes earlier and I'm wounded. <laughs> so I'm just going to sit down across from you and then after some bullshit dialogue I'll pull a gun and shoot you he did that twice and then he's in a car chase of course we don't know what he was chasing but he was in the middle of a car chase and it just cuts oh serving McDonald's like, like serve, serving McDonald's stop serving wheat pies after this era, <laughs> hour it's like the end of Texas Chainsaw Massacre just like this just, abrupt cut yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, which is and, amazing and even more so because at least that was like at the end of the plot she'd ostensibly gotten away here he's in the middle of a fucking chase he, so the ostensive plot of this movie is that Steven Seagal is called in to do an op and they're like you know the most He's important an op doer in first op, of all yeah. that's, that's He's, his that's background a pre-op, pre-op. job pre-op <laughs> <laughs> so pre-op they uh, they're like so Steven we're getting you everything you need for your op which is a 26 year old woman who wants to fuck you for some reason and Asian Kyle McLaughlin who and has a remote control. control cars and helicopters yeah. so their adversaries are like it's the Mexican drug cartel and Al Qaeda Hezbollah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Th- they're so we never like really know. Chocolate and peanut butter. Yeah. Yeah, we never really know what they're doing. I mean, I think they want to smuggle like this bomb maker Raouf. Yeah, Raouf yeah. to America <laughs> across the border. But, but it's yeah, onion. Yeah, but it's like I think Felix said. Oh, it, it was a. Uh, you know that that classic economy we all know and love the drugs for terrorism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah I, you know, I just love that terrorism you guys do. Nine eleven. I like, mean, uh, forget, forget Al Qaeda. Di- forget about the billions of dollars in drugs we smuggle across this border every year. It's much more valuable <laughs> for us to get you over there, so you could do a terror attack that will destroy our entire business. Yeah. So the Sinola cartel is just like, yeah, we're actually out of money. We just gave away all our drugs to see terrorism happen. <laughs> it's our favorite thing, but. They never actually get it done because every meeting between, like, you actually can't tell who's the cartel no. and who's Al Qaeda Hezbollah <laughs> because it's well, just, yeah, because it's they're just all a bunch Dagestani. of right. It's all a bunch of Dagestani's in like ill-fitting fourteen-button pinstripe suits <laughs> who are like, "You told me no one would be here," <laughs> and the other guy is like. I only told you to expect what you did not expect. <laughs> and then there's then there's just a fucking barrel of molasses in a leather jacket wandering outside the mansion, hitting guys in the back of the head. Just and this just, shuffling, yeah, marinated yeah. bear like, of the yeah, There's one scene like there's one scene uh, towards the, the end of the movie yeah. uh, when what is I guess supposed to be the climax of the movie where like, oh, it's all really happening. Where, like, he sneaks into, like, the terror drug compound, and it's just like, you motherfuckers didn't count on a man moving this slowly, did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, just, yeah. like, there's, like, some guy by the security camera, and there's literally a long <laughs> shot of him. They're like, he's very slowly walking up behind you, and then the guy turns around and sees him, and Seagal keeps walking towards him at the same pace. That, I mean... And then he just, like, does this Seagal <laughs> thing where he just sort of, like... Fl- does his arm his he flicks his arms around and like throws the guy on the ground and then just keeps standing completely immobile waiting for the guy to get <laughs> back up again so he can throw him on the ground felt, another time it felt like he had watched the raid 2 in preparation because he did that weird fight thing where like he put his totally limp wrist up against the oh, limp right. wrist yeah, of yeah. the other guy like 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 in gonna, the kitchen scene like the, the kitchen that, scene yeah. in raid 2 but like the, do you remember the shot where he the guy down and then the guy's down the ground, so <laughs> yes, yes. takes a table into his head <laughs> for like good measure just to like confirm that the guy's done. Or whether he throws the guy on the ground and he's like, stay down, pitch. <laughs> 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 but, but let's not give the listeners the wrong impression. This is a dialogue driven movie. Yes. Oh my god, oh, it's all so so much like talking. Rashomon all talking. There's so much talking. It is the Rashomon of Hungary yeah. or whatever. There, there, there are at least Hungary, three <laughs> There are at least three um, total like digressions, almost break, breaking the fourth wall, where he's like, "By the way, we don't hate Muslims." <laughs> like he's literally like, "Well, no, I don't care about you know anyone's religion." And the girl's like, "Right, because the true believers don't do terrorism." And they're like looking into the camera because like you know whatever the government of Dagestan yeah. made them put this yeah, caveat. Yeah. Oh my in god! There. No, and he said, "He's like, you motherfuckers really think this is all about religion?" I understand a warrior fighting for their cause, but it's like the great Genghis Khan someone said, worship whoever God, 
but pay me taxes. Yeah. You know, who, shout out to his, uh, to uh, Ramsey Kordorov. <laughs> you, you know, your shining star. You know who <laughs> never killed women and children? Genghis Khan. That's true. Yeah, yeah, really? yeah. 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 Uh, I so this movie. When you watch it, like there are technically things happening every thirty minutes. Every thirty minutes, Steven Seagal, like, you know, in this universe, in the universe of Seagal, the worst thing that can happen to you is a fat guy touching your wrist, and that's why he wears <laughs> that's why he wears divorce guy bracelets, so no one can do it to him. But every thirty minutes there's a sequence of that. But in between it, like as Amber said, it's so dialogue driven, it actually Feels like depression. It, oh, God, after yeah. we should have done like a conference call to a suicide hotline yeah, because, because I felt ended, directionless we so and without enervated. purpose. It's like we had been slowly exposed to radiation poisoning over the course of watching this movie, and our like bones were just absorbing uranium. And we're, it's By like the end, it ironically was like wearing a lead vest, walking yeah. down a hotel hallway full of clothes. Yeah, doors. it's almost as though a shadowy Eastern European regime had doused us with polonium. <laughs> watching this movie, it will give you the same sensation as taking a bubble bath in Fukushima water. <laughs> Why she get? Uh, it's like when they when you're at the dentist's office and they give you that lead apron and then leave the room, <laughs> yeah, like pointing a giant yeah. like gun at your head, yeah. and you then know, they also the, make you smoke the four dollar gas station cigarettes that are called like Mavericks. You know, <laughs> okay. total par- total total side note. But did you know that there's a theory that uh, the government killed Jack Ruby because he died of cancer? Mm. But the theory is is that he was taken to one of his checkups and they put him in a room with an x-ray machine and they just turned it on. Yeah, but that was like on. the 1960s. So that yeah. people, they probably did that all the time. Right. Yeah, they, they just did that to children. Yeah. And then, ah, yeah. Hold on, I have to go drunk drive on they, the way to my affair. <laughs> <laughs> they gave them a nice DDT wash yeah. to keep them clean. Um, and then... They actually they actually had him watch Contract to a Kill. They had a time machine and they took it back. <laughs> <laughs> now... <laughs> I don't want to give uh, listeners the impression that we're just going to be talking about no. Steven Seagal uh, for this um, entire episode. Yeah, By the you, way, sh- you people should know enough about <laughs> Steven Seagal but, by but, now. Yeah. But there is a through line. The thing well, we're yeah, about I was to talk s- about. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say I want to make the segue now from one sort of um, greasy, black-haired, just sort of ape-like uh, moron to another. <laughs> yeah. And um, of course, I'm talking about Don Jr. I mean, did, did we? Did we That's notice, in the news. Did we notice that Don Jr.'s email, like their attempt to collude, is like as convoluted, stupid, and pointless as contract to a kill. Like, it's, yeah. they probably had the same conversation where Don Jr. and like Sergey Fukalov or whatever met in a room and they just like mumbled at each other and then left because either they didn't expect some guy to be here or there was some fact it was Steve Bannon was wandering around outside <laughs> well, like like the, the the defense now of Don Jr from his uh partisans and and the you know the 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 Trump defenders is that like well nothing came of this meeting and that's exactly like watching a Seagal movie like it's over <laughs> it happens and then you wonder what happened what was this i don't yeah. they, they talked for a while about stuff they clearly didn't understand one another yeah. they made no actual communication of meaning so yeah, it's best. If that's probably exactly like a Seagal movie. Another thing they have in common is that I'm fairly certain that they both caught gonorrhea at the same uh, sex slave brothel in the Crimea. Yeah, and they're like I, I got to say though, I I just barely again read a little bit about this, but that's the correct approach. Yeah, that's the way yeah. I do it. I, I did see one headline that made me understand it better than others, and it was actually from Slate. And it says, comparing Donald Trump Jr. to Fredo Corleone is grossly unfair to Fredo. <laughs> I mean, it is. Fredo had way more I'm initiative. Smart. Yeah. Fredo, Fredo like, went to Las Vegas all by himself. Yeah, yeah Met exactly. Mo Green. Mm-hmm. Like, got, got bang, slapped bang, around. Bang the cocktail waitresses two yep. at a time. Yeah, yep. Donald Trump Jr., like his dad, has probably never had sex. <laughs> and, like, I mean... I think I believe like whenever when Don Jr. released those emails and was like, um, you know, I actually didn't do anything because of our experience with all the Seagal movies. Yeah, we do believe him because this is, you know, just like in Contract to a Kill, they never really fully exchanged terrorism for drugs or whatever. Nothing happened. No. No, no we don't. But dialogue like dialogue driven. Do you imagine Don Jr. like trying to coordinate an intelligence operation? Yeah, like, that, that what is would the, that be like? like? That is the that is simultaneously the thing that has made this such a long running scandal and is going to dog this entire administration. I mean, at least in public, who cares? Who knows if it's going to have any meaningful impact? Uh, but the same reason uh, that it's it's that is the same reason that nothing really amounted to anything because they're too stupid to keep it quiet, but they're also too stupid to actually coordinate anything or like be genuine like back channels of information. 
Yeah, am- am- they would just like mass text the Trump family. Yo, I found this stuff out from the Russians. It's fucked up. Yeah, imagine if like they tried to do the Nixon thing and sabotage like peace talks. Yeah, can you imagine how bad they would fuck that up? They'd yeah. be like, "All right, so we bought a bunch of bots from this guy on Reddit, and they're going to say the peace talks gay, <laughs> and then uh, then we're going to do a video where a cart we we repurpose a carpet warehouse jingle yeah. to be slideshows." <laughs> Of our dad saying the deal is bad, <laughs> and then uh, then the reality TV star is going to say that my dad grabbed her pussy, and then we're just only going to talk about that for two months, and then we're going to forget we were supposed to do this. <laughs> and what was I talking about? And of course, you couldn't tell Trump himself about any of this because he would immediately, say, folks, we got a great plan for winning the election. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> The other thing, the other just, I mean, again, like, I, there's not too much here worth talking about. It's basically just funny. However, like, none of this is really illegal. Like, collusion yeah. isn't a criminal charge. I mean, it hints at something possibly illegal. You would need, Who knows, you would need but, proof of an ex- a material exchange. And that's what they've not, basically, they have shown, well, the Russians maybe did this stuff, and they certainly offered it to them. But that's what that's not a thing it's only a thing if they say oh thank you and here in exchange for this is something else and that exchange back there's no evidence of anything that's why that's why the trump family its stupidity and greediness is going to save it because like don jr was probably like yeah you're going to get a ba- limited edition terry cloth bathrobe egyptian <laughs> cotton from the trump hotel in azerbaijan and they just never <laughs> sent it <laughs> And that's like why he gets acquitted. Well, I yeah. think the, the smartest take on like like all of this, the thing that makes the most sense to me, and just how like unbelievably stupid and amateurish this all was, you know, because like you know, in a presidential campaign, like it's conceivable that you would meet some shady person to get oppo on the other party or whatever. But oh, like you mean fa- like Hayam Zaban? <laughs> yeah, or like yeah. the fact that they're emailing about this shit is hilarious. But like, I think the thing that makes the most sense is someone who pointed out that like. I, none of the people in like the Trump team campaign team thought he was going to win the election, no. and they just yeah. thought that like, well, you know, we're just going to use the platform and notoriety that this gives us to do what we always do, which is just grift relentlessly yeah. and like I don't know, get some sort of shady deal to like right. Matt, like you said, build a casino and fucking yeah, you know. yeah, it, Donbass, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, folks, this is going to be great. Uh, we're gonna. You know, our brand is more well known than ever. And then after January, we're going to have all these names in this Rolodex, and we can, yeah, put together the world's best floating casino in the Crimea. Yeah. We're going to have the world's greatest casino in Sochi. It's going to be staffed entirely by wild dogs. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I, I want to I come back to, to this idea at the end of the show uh, with our reading series this week. But again, like. Is it criminal? I don't know. Probably at some level. I'm yeah. sure they're all crooks. Yeah, uh, yeah I also I, I, I'm not don't care. I'm not gonna, I'm not, yeah, I don't really care, and I'm not going to hold my breath like it's going to bring down the Trump administration. However, what is hilarious is just again and again, I love thinking about the people who either pretend to or genuinely do love Trump because he's like, brave warrior protecting alpha. western civilization <laughs> extremely like- alpha man who <laughs> just only talks about media gossip and different yeah. different horrible cakes he eats <laughs> mo- uh, he is charles martel charles like- martel in his day he would have made a proclamation in the center of town and been like so edgar the scroll maker wanted to come to my new year's party and i said no <laughs> <laughs> Way more people read my scrolls, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what's so baffling and insane is that Trump is the embodiment of every degenerate trend in in Western civilization to make men effete and weak and fat and incompetent and lazy and and uh, and effeminate. You know, like everything that they hate about what modern society does to men is embodied in one yeah. diaper yeah. monstrosity. He's a, he's a hand talker that uses a bottle of Aquanet a day and watches Rachel Ray every night. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, so, I'm so sick of these pussified Western men who have never read books, never exercised, <laughs> only talk about stupid gossip and <laughs> interior decoration. Donald Trump is the opposite Furniture. of all these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And of course they like him because... At a certain level, like you know, his real base of, of you know pissy retirees is just the same way. They've all yeah. been like, like turned into Holstein cows. I think they? there's I think there's a thing going on too, where like a lot of the more like younger aggressive suburban authoritarians, like 
they probably want to be that fruity. <laughs> like a little bit. They kind yeah. they probably want to like instead of doing a daughter purity dance, like they want to be their daughter. That's what that's about. Yeah. And then oh, they yeah. see this guy who's up there and he's like M- Mika looks terrible. <laughs> and they're like Dude. I wish I could be that, but I can't, so I'm going to pretend it's alpha. Masculinity really is a trap. Like yeah. queen it up, you'll be happier. I'm yeah. a, I'm a Donald very, certainly is. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a sp- it's not a sliding scale. It's like you can be the most masculine man ever, which means you're physically filthy, but you can also like feminine things like Les Miserables. <laughs> <laughs> I'm way happier right. than the president. Yeah. Yeah, you're a happy, well-rounded person. Yeah. Well-rounded now, um, son. Like I said, I want to uh I want to come back again to the idea of uh Donald Trump as sort of a hero of antiquity. Well. Um but before we do, uh, I want to take a, a digression to the other, uh, the, other, the other story that's been heating up the interwebs. And I'm referring to uh, David Brooks, because he's been on a roll recently. And uh, he, he... Also very similar to Seagal. How so? Oh, how so? A Jewish man with an identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm little, not wrong. This is a little motherfucking oh thing we you call so Prisetta. Okay, this is another... I, I don't know this for sure but I'd be willing to bet money that Steven Seagal has made a woman he's dated change, change her name. Change her name? Yeah. First and last. You're Yuriko now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife, Sally Moon. <laughs> <laughs> Harley Quinn, get in here. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, uh, David... Uh, and David's it's back on his bullshit. David's yeah, back yeah. on his bullshit. Pussy uh, overrated, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like future. And uh, no, he was on. Uh, he was on this thing that everyone was uh, tweeting about yesterday about um, about uh, the, the, it, he wrote. It, he's been okay. Just a, like a week ago, he had an amazingly good uh, op-ed piece about uh, people canceling plans is a sign of Western decline, and it was just again like revealing that. Everyone's just like, yeah, David, sorry to flake on lunch again, but oh, I got to yeah. got to rewind some videotapes. Uh, <laughs> you know, and yeah, no one wants to hang out with David Brooks and he wrote a whole uh, column the, about it. The willingness to do that and at no point acknowledge the absurdity of it and the obvious implication that you're just talking about the fact oh, that no. nobody wants to hang out with you. He would never consider the possibility yeah. that anyone but it's would just, cancel. It's such a limpian delusion that it's breathtaking. I'm actually, it's almost like the man you, has a gift. It's like one of those things where you have to have that in order to be an effective op-ed columnist, especially for something like. Yeah, so there's, there's a new you have to like have self-awareness drilled out of your head with a fucking like a power drill. Yeah, you have to be deprogrammed. Yeah, there's a new problem, new trend with women where they're afraid to have sex with cool men because they're afraid they'll fall in love with them. <laughs> <laughs> they do it once. Um, but yeah, so the thing that so he wrote so he wrote another column this week that was I guess about go ahead now, David. Yeah, <laughs> it, the idea was about like you know that uh, again it's this sort of Charles Murray thesis that like the real inequality in American life is that cognitive educated elites are sequestering themselves in neighborhoods and food trucks and uh, podcasts and you know are and the sort of uh, Non high school educated blue collar working class folks uh, don't get the benefits of their you know thrifty uh, cosmopolitan life choices. Parenthetically, parenthetically, uh, just as like a, a right off the bat explainer, that entire thesis and that is the Brooks thesis and it's the Murray thesis and it's a lot of these guys' belief and it boils down to the fact that because deindustrialization started in black communities in the 60s and 70s before hitting white communities in the 90s and aughts is that the pathologies that were associated with black culture, like with black people, have somehow migrated to white people in these same communities that have seen deindustrialization later. And they need an explanation for that. And they have decided essentially that blackness is contagious and it can only be corralled yeah. by inoculating it's a pathology white people and, it's and it can be inoculated for white people by exposing them to I don't know uh, Netflix and PBS and well it's also the class mobility fantasy they have yeah. I mean yes, David so, Brooks yeah, thinks time. My Fair Lady is a porno yeah, <laughs> yeah. well yeah he's, he's living it why can't my research assistant learn how to fuck <laughs> <laughs> ah, 
<laughs> yes. Ouch. Uh, um, uh, no, so let me just read the, uh, the actual paragraph that everyone was uh, making fun of and laughing at. Uh, so he's, uh, you know, goes on blah, blah, blah about, you know, like how, you know, rich dad, poor dad, you know, rich high school, bad high school bullshit. And then he goes, recently, I took a friend with only a high school degree to lunch. No. Bullshit. Pause there. Pause there. Bullshit. Hold on. No way. Okay, pause obviously there. this didn't happen, yes. but, but I was trying to think of what he took and made into this story and and you think it was just someone canceling on well, him no i think that he was at like this restaurant by the way uh, Matt Iglesias, treat boy extraordinaire, <laughs> did some like shoe leather reporting and found what he thought was the, the, uh, here's the, the sandwich restaurant place. in D.C. It's the sandwich yeah, place. It's in the middle of the city. It's got like words like Pomodoro and Sapresetta on there. And so he's like, and you know what? I think he's right. But I think obviously what happened is, is that he was either flaked on or he went by himself to eat lunch, looked at the menu and had the brilliant insight. You know what? I bet if I was just a college, high school educated middle American, I'd be very intimidated. Yeah, by no, this. No, let me no, let me no, let me no, read. No, wait, I'm sorry. An interaction, just like Thomas Friedman's uh, cab driver. Yeah, yeah mo- I, I, most. I I think, I I think the obvious thing is that he was actually taking his maid out for her three month review. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean that's literally. The only thing I can imagine him having a friend who yeah he has no interaction with people who only went to high school. I mean, like most New York Times opinion writing is just fiction writing. It's you know your yeah. your fictional hi- only high school graduation certificate friend, your cab driver who told yeah. you about how Doha is going to be about Amazon Prime this year. Your fuck it, your 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 son who's like. Dad, no one's having sex anymore. <laughs> it's just a bunch of interactions that you imagine it's the, it's the that fantasy, create the, It's the fantasy you, woke child. Right. It's, yeah. the, it's just the interactions yeah, and, that and you imagine that back, up, that back up your, your narrative of the world. Yeah. And it's never something cool like, you know, I met someone who does the knockout game. <laughs> You know, and I now I approve of it. It's always yeah. just something, some bullshit. Let me, well, like the thing that. is, is that they are forced. They have to have a take every week. And the thing is, is that one of those tricks they teach you in, in opinion writing is ha- give it an actual hook, like give it real characters, not just ideas. And so they, you're not fucking having these interactions that often, but you do have to like belabor a point with a fake anecdote. Well, l- let me get to the actual anecdote in case you, you know, are familiar with it. David Brooks takes his friend uh, with only a high school degree to lunch and insensitively, I led her into a gourmet sandwich shop. Suddenly, I saw her face freeze up as she was confronted with sandwiches named Padrino and Pomodoro and ingredients like Sopracetta, Capicola. Is she Bill the Butcher? And, and, and Gabagool Baguette. No, uh, so he's just, it's just a sandwich shop. And, uh, and he goes, I quickly asked her if she wanted to go somewhere else, and she anxiously <laughs> nodded yes, and we ate Mexican. Okay, before we tee off on this. Yeah, they, Mexico listen, is also we tee a off. country. Listen, you wicked Jew, the next time you take me to an establishment that serves me papist hams, <laughs> think again. I'll take a boiled ham, just like mother used to make. <laughs> My best friend, Bill the Butcher. Before, one thing that needs to be, we've already established this, but just you know, in case anyone was confused, this anecdote did not happen. Zero nope. percent. David no. and I, and I can no. feel comfortable saying that because David Brooks has a long history of doing exactly this, especially around eateries yep. and, and, and food experiences. Uh, like I believe in one of his books, he went to some, you know, like the, the Charles Murray fish town, the real America town, and then says, you know, you could spend all day trying to spend $20 on dinner and you couldn't do it. And then a journalist went to the town he actually mentions and like finds that there goes to a Red Lobster within five minutes of getting yes. there and says, you can easily spend over $20 on dinner. Called David Brooks about this and then David Brooks accused him of being unethical or something like that. <laughs> there was the famous Applebee's salad bar uh, awesome. you know, thing. Uh, again, he said he, the folks at the Applebee's salad bar, there are no such thing at Applebee's. Yep. So it's not a stretch to think that David has made this up one more time, but yep. he's making it up in service of something that's been a long-running shtick for him, which is this idea, the sort of conservative sort of yuppie idea about class that he's trying to transmit to his mostly upper and upper middle class liberal New York Times readers, which is that class is really about cultural capital. Mm -hmm. And it's about these sort of like tastes and affectations rather than money and your relation, your class relationship to capital. And I want to just, you know, pick out one thing uh, that I, someone 
uh, capped from uh, Thomas Frank, who was writing about this same thing that David Brooks did back in 2004. And Thomas Frank writes here, David Brooks goes even further, concluding from his fieldwork in Red America that the standard notion of class is flawed. Thinking about class in terms of hierarchy, where some people occupy more exalted position than others, he writes, is Marxist and presumably illegitimate. The correct model, he suggests, is a high school cafeteria. Again, food. Segmented into self-chosen taste clusters like nerds, jocks, punks, bikers, techies, druggies, god squatters, and so on. Bre- Frank, Frank quotes Brooks, writing, the jocks knew there would always be nerds, and the nerds knew there would always be jocks. That's just the way life is. We choose where we want to sit and whom we want to mimic and what class we belong to. It's the, the $20 same way breakfast club. We choose hairstyles and TV shows. We're all free agents in this non-coercive class system. Oh my God, that's infuriating. And Brooks eventually <laughs> concludes that worrying about the problems faced by workers is yet another deluded affectation of the yeah. blue state rich. I- I mean, Brooks is exactly like every fucking chud who screams about Muslim. Yeah, but he's a chud that does interviews. He's Chud Turkle. Right. So he's (laughs) right. He's like every fucking chud that screams about Muslim rape gangs and the and the Apex Gang if they're Australian, who is in charge of like a few blue collar guys makes about one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, but thinks they're blue collar because they listen to like. Chud Truckley or Chase Whitney or Whitney Poole or whoever the fuck. That's been their fucking strategy for 30 years. They've been detaching class from economics and replacing it with culture because they can win on that terrain. It's amazing, though, because everyone knows with just like the slightest bit of thought that this is utterly untrue. Well, yeah. I, I, I taught at NYU, and I would talk to people who were the children of you know russian oligarchs or like their family owned three factories in shinjin they had major like cultural uh, competency difficulties coming into the u.s for the first time i mean it's extremely difficult coming from yeah. one of those countries and trying to navigate and trying to navigate america but you know what they're going to be just <laughs> fine. They got that money. Well, that's because what these guys always do, and when they talk about things like cultural capital or education or uh, or getting married, they take the wings that are symptomatic of having wealth and economic security and turn them into causes. They reverse causality. Yeah. They say, oh, they're, they are able to maintain relationships because they're uh, are, uh, they're being able to maintain relationships is why they have money. Or being, or uh, you know, having certain cultural uh, touchstones and being able to converse at a certain level is why they have money. No, it's the other way around. Obviously, it's the other way around. You're like you have you have you little money. You can't money have the stability anything. to stay married, right? Because I mean, that would be to alter. You know, that that would be to make them complicit well, in a world so that is fundamentally is like, unfair. I could explain in one sentence how uh, poverty causes you causes less marriage. One sentence, and I just did it. You know. You're not stable enough economically. You can't maintain these relationships. The pressures are too great. Done. I finished it. They've attempted it. They have billions of dollars behind it as a propaganda campaign, but nobody could explain to you how getting married keeps you from being poor if you were poor. Now, they could all, never what, no, fucking what explain What they say, that. what they explain is that they like list, they rattle off a bunch of statistics about positive life outcomes for people who like, you know, get married and uh, fin- get married after finishing college. Right. Not the results of marriage, <laughs> yeah. but Not it's the a positive life yeah. outcome. Okay. Now, uh, you know, it's been a sort of hobby horse of ours on the show that when you know whenever you see someone either saying or implying that politics is downstream from culture you can be guaranteed that they're grifting you or they're full of shit or they're just a right winger in some yeah. way it's but always can I just the economy say I'm still really proud of Chud Sterkle <laughs> yeah, that was very good uh Someone else who also believes very highly in social capital and who weighed in quite heavily in a lengthy thread on David Brooks is, of course, our other friend, someone who I like even more than David Brooks, <laughs> Megan McArdle, who's yeah. back again. The, the, the walking galactic brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Megan Car- McArdle. Yeah, and the Galactic Brain Re- League is Megan, Megan McGriddle, Macron. And, uh, yeah, I got to say Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, oh, yeah, that... that 
what, who's that fucking guy with the like perfectly round head in England? Rupert Evans, Rupert Owens. Oh, is that the baby one? That's the baby. A racist? He's the yeah. boss baby. Yeah. Oh God. He's he's, he's, he's the he's British. Uh, and his name is Rupert. That's a teddy bear's name. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> and he's got a little bow tie. He's the British exploding. I guy. love how the the sort of David Brooks is of England. David Brooks, it could be like a cool guy, a cool tough guy's name, but in England, there's no mistakes like that. Every David Brooks yeah. guy is named like. Uh, Jeremiah Buttersworth, <laughs> the <laughs> of a, uh, wigwam chunsley, yeah. eaten syrup sleeve. So Megan uh, went off on a long, a long thread defending uh, Brooks, and you know, asking, you know, how many of you have taken a genuinely working class person to lunch? Well, uh, guess what. Not David Brooks, and not you either, Megan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So she goes on and off, and, and also it, take them to lunch. That's the wording that makes me think it was his maid. Yeah. Right. That, yeah, yeah, you don't take a friend to lunch. So you go to lunch you meet with a them friend. For yeah. lunch. I noticed yeah. this in the uh, in the replies of the people talking to to Megan, and uh, I just wanted it was one interaction I want to I want to cap here. Uh, this guy uh, Rev Kev Geo <laughs> replies to Megan and says, "As a pastor, I eat with working class and homeless members regularly, and it's those relationships that made me so angry to read Brooks's piece." He continues. No one comes to me saying, help me fit in with the upper middle class. They come saying, I need money, food, housing, childcare. Megan's response to this, I think his point is that social capital matters for the mobility to get the stuff you need. Oh, my wow. God, no. Yeah. This is, yeah. This is yeah. Mean Girls. This is yeah. Mean Girls. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, where uh, Regina George um, it, you know, rules ruthlessly, and the unpopular kids hate her. And then uh, Gretchen Wiener says, well, I can't help it if people are jealous of me. Yeah. And, and they're just like, oh, you want to be me? It's like, no, no, no. We hate you. Yeah. We just like to be able to fucking survive. We just being want your fear stuff. At all times. We want your yeah. stuff. But, and, the, and the way to prove conclusively that claims like McArdle's here, that social capital is more important, is as is, is easily is, and perfectly disproved as similar claims that it's about education or getting married or anything. It's like, if you apply that, imagine you could snap your fingers and your wish for this community was granted. They all of a sudden have all the cultural capital and ability to negotiate uh, amongst uh, money that you do. They all are married with, to, their, to the person who had their kid. They all have education. They're if, all listening to NPR. They're all doing those things. If every one of them did them, you would still see tons of them poor because those spots are limited. Mm -hmm. And if everybody had it, I mean, these people claim to love economy, economics 101, but have you ever heard about fucking inflation? If everybody could code, it would not be worth anything on the market. If everybody has bourgeois social cues, the bourgeois social cues are not a value added anymore. Yep. So none of these things, if universally applied, would solve anything. Yeah, I mean, also, I think the unstated thing here is how cool McMagan and David Brooks and all these people think upper middle class <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. culture yeah. is. I grew up upper middle class. It's like the culture is fucking awful. All you do is just eat like dry pieces of bread that you smear like various moldy cheeses on and talk <laughs> and talk about That's the always and what talk, I thought it was. And talk about the fucking wait list at Brown and like, <laughs> well, you know, uh, the new a new play. Like everyone doesn't just go to plays every year to see if they're still bad. <laughs> like, it's like it, it's trash. No one should want it. Okay. Uh, and this is like, wait, wait. To, to, uh, just one okay. quickly. Another thing that undermines it and completely destroys it is okay, fine. Even if you think it's a noble pursuit, what is your strategy for actually doing this? Does David Brooks want to go into like a, a dirty pool hall and Henry set up Higgins. a shingle that says, uh, ask me about sailing terms? Yeah. And then he gets a fucking pool cue broken over his head? That's, uh, that's the new uh, roadhouse. He wants to be <laughs> Patrick, Swa Higgins. Patrick Swayze, back from the dead, uh, escorts David Brooks through various rough and tumble bars. Yes, as and then he teaches them bourgeois values of yeah, thrift and diligence. Yeah, he's like, uh, class pain don't hurt, and class isn't about money. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> shit, that's gonna happen now. Yeah. That's really uh, Patrick Swayze's coming back. I brought him back to life, everybody. <laughs> but uh, to Felix's uh, point about um, how just utterly banal and awful these uh, up upper middle class uh, values that you know uh, Brooks seem and McGriddle seems to think are so in vogue. Uh, I, I have I got to talk about McMegan because you know I'm a I'm a connoisseur of McMegan, yeah. and and it's so funny that like you know in that long thread she's 
you know, it's clear what she's doing. She's, you know, like, it's the same move they always do, which is to be like, oh, you know, you claim to care about, you know, the poor and working class, but you don't really know any of them. Like, presumably I do, and, like, I speak their language and understand them in a way that, you know, cosmopolitan liberals don't. I seem to read a couple things from Meghan McArdle right now, and it's funny because it's all based around food. Uh, this is quote. This is from. These people are all just hungry. This is from they just her. Right when they're hungry. I just want to read a few selections from a column McMegan wrote for Bloomberg called "The Gotta Have It All Kitchen Gift Guide." <laughs> <sighs> Subhead: Good news, America! You can now buy a Thermomix. Imagine What's that? her. Uh, what is that? Uh, I, oh, I will let you know. <laughs> I will let you know. So on a. So this. Okay, I'm just going to sh- show Matt. Where? Look how long this piece is. I'm going to scroll, and Matt, okay. you just like let the let the. All let right, the, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Between this and the eight. Juicero, we're Holy just like a kitchen sh- gadget block. That's now. like oh my I'm god. I'm still scrolling. I'm still there scrolling. There have to be two dozen like paragraph long items. This on is different. The, Oh, maybe I'm sorry. More like thirty. I'm still scrolling. Holy I'm shit! I'm still are you scrolling. Are kidding me? Okay, this is the longest thing McGriddle has ever written, and, and it's, it's about it's all about kitchen implements and, that and you can buy. And just like on the road, she wrote it on one long scroll and <laughs> then mailed it. In. Okay, <laughs> uh, on her list, uh, uh, she she suggests buying. High quality jar shaped measuring spoons. Fuck you. You wouldn't think there'd be much to say about measuring spoons. Yes. Uh, at least in, unless you've spent time hunting for your spoons, trying to oh, divine God. the size of a cheap plastic one. <laughs> no, it's not that okay. hard. Next, next I item. I waste oh, time God. hunting for spoons. Ne- next item. All the time. <laughs> ne- again, and Megan is. Is speaking. that a euphemism, you know, when you're hunting for your yeah. spoons? <laughs> I mean, if she was, if this she was, is like you, you, you. We noticed how unbelievably long this is but like Megan is putting in the work here of educating working class yeah. people on how to gain the social like capital you, to wait, get wait, the wait, social wait. mobility to get the health care that they need look okay yeah I understand all right you live with your mom you take care of her uh, you basically survive on her disability and uh, and some Medicaid I get that you know uh, you have a you have a high school education uh, uh, you went to a school with very low standards uh, you really have no ability to get anything other than like into a scam for-profit college that you're going to pay $100,000 for. I understand that. But where's your microplane? <laughs> uh, if you just got a microplane <laughs> to get that real good zest from the lemons in your meringue, I think this whole thing could turn around for you. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, every one of these gadgets is what an upper middle class person uses to escape the eternal screaming terror in their brains that their <laughs> lives are meaningless <laughs> and that everyone is surrounded by them hates them and the only reason people talk to them is because they're all cushioned by this cloud of money and this assurance that nothing will ever happen to them but deep inside it's just an, it's like every day their brain is just replaying contract to kill that's how truly <laughs> Empty and pointless, their lives <laughs> haven't are. had an orgasm in six months. Get a garlic press, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, get an extra large spatula. Megan says, A few years back, we somehow acquired a fish spatula. I don't know how because I hate cooked fish. <sighs> that was when I realized that a very big spatula is how do an you ex- accidentally <laughs> get specialty <laughs> kitchen items. Matt, calm down, Matt. Please calm down. It's normal, Matt. I'm trying, this is, I'm you know, trying you to pop educate. like three Ambien and then you order them in your sleep. <laughs> that's the most like exciting. Like Megan McArdle does. No, okay. That's the most exciting oh, thing you're, that's you're, happened. You're to stealing. Them. You're stealing my thunder here. I'm, I'm breaking out of the the holiday gift guide and I'm going back to a classic McArdle column that begins like this. I haven't taken a full count. But as far as I can estimate, we have nearly 90 rolls of bounty, ba- bounty paper towels in our basement. Four you bathrooms, I can shit all day. <laughs> you could be forgiven for thinking we were stocking up for an expected flood from a nearby orange juice factory. Just terrible writing. Awful. What? Awful. But like, okay, she goes what? on and on. So wait a minute. Oh, wait. For months, so she I, wait, so either <laughs> has an orange juice factory next to door, which is banal and pointless detail, or she made up an orange juice factory, <laughs> which is somehow even explain. more banal. I'll, I'll, this is her and her gamer husband, who of yeah. course live in a very upscale part of Washington, D.C. that's just recently been gentrified. And she says, for months, I've been dutifully taking paper towels out of their Amazon boxes, wondering why they seem to come so frequently. For months, my husband has been tucking the excess neatly away on basement shelves, wondering why our household's current paper towel balance had continued to grow even after he canceled his subscription. The truth was only revealed when my husband happened to be downstairs at the blah, blah, blah. It just goes on like that. Uh, I'm just going to really quickly <laughs> read a few other items from the uh, Gotta Have It All Kitchen gift guide for the porn working class. Uh, a pizza mesh. 
which ensures the moistness and crisp of your pizza uh, dough. Just get the Giorno. <laughs> Wait. Um, do you want it moist or do you want it crisp? Yeah, it's uh, the paradox machine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a qu- it operates on quantum Schrodinger's Heidegger, pizza. Heidegger's crust. Schrodinger's pizza. <laughs> a twine dispenser, <laughs> poor, <laughs> poor ficked bowls. Uh, the, the, um, let's see. Twine dispenser sounds like an old timey insult. You got damn twine dispenser. Yeah, yeah. A Padorno four blade spiralizer. Oh, is that one of those long that books is. that Matt and Amber like to read? <laughs> <laughs> Padorno. Um, <laughs> One of those very long, <laughs> long books where you guys are like, oh, I, we love as Padorno said. Yeah. <laughs> um, a a Zojirushi rice cooker. Oh, my God. Uh, Lady. Co- copper, That's just an offensive made-up Asian. Copper, name. salt, and pepper mills. And by the way, the salt and pepper mills are in the $50 to $150 range. But I got to get down to the very, this very bottom. This is honestly... Uh, long jockeys. <laughs> <laughs> This is like one of those chapters in American Psycho that's just a list of oh, items. Yeah. Okay, listen to this, but imagine Christian Bale is reading it. <laughs> yeah. This is the Thermomix. Just as I always begin with the humble lemon zester, I always end the guide with this machine, which is the opposite. A hypertrophied kitchen appliance that chops, stirs, and even cooks the food for you. Being able to cook and stir at once reduces a lot of tedious kitchen tasks, from sauce making to caramelizing onions for bacon jam to a few seconds of prep work. <laughs> no other appliance in my kitchen has done so much to save me time and effort in the kitchen. For, for what? What are you do saving I, do time I, for? Do I, mix, do I need a Thermomix? No one needs one, but no other machine is going to let you stick all the ingredients for a bechamel or hollandaise into the jar, press a few buttons, and walk away, returning but- 10 minutes later to a perfectly done sauce. Or caramelize onions without standing over oh the stove God. for an hour. She repeated the caramelizing onions task uh, well, well, Because caramelizing onions is like the one thing that, that like a casual take hour, cook though. would take. It takes like 45 minutes 40 to minutes do it right. Or so, yeah. 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 It's, like, it's like making risotto. It's, it actually is labor intensive. So, of course, they stay up at night in terror at the thought of having to do it. This is making me go into a depression spiral. This is reminding me of being at my friend's houses when I was like nine and thinking like, is this all there is to life? Well, you should get the new uh, Canmore depression spiralizer. Yeah, it's, it's $80 it's, 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 and it'll make you into a good person. It's just like when she says like, you know, all those tedious cooking tasks. I can save time not doing those tedious tasks. And doing what? Just, like, looking up uh, different versions of the same thing that you already bought? Like, making a spreadsheet of your Amazon purchases? What? What are you doing? Just kill yourself. Uh, excuse me, but somebody has to do a rigorous fisking of the uh, UN's latest fraudulent reports on casualties from Iraq. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, take oh, a guess a how much the Thermomix shit. costs, though. Uh, uh, that sounds like a $5,000 I'm going to say 7500 This is price it's, is it's right, right now. It's cheaper than that. It's cheaper oh, than okay. that. Okay. It's, it's only $1,800. Oh, word. Do you guys want one? Oh, yeah, yeah. never mind. That's <laughs> yeah. a good deal. All right, I take it back everything. That's a yeah, we're terrific getting one for deal. the Park Slope Mansion. Yeah, so We're going to whisk together. I mean, the, our bechamels, our after-show bechamels suck. You yeah. know, I really want to get a good bechamel. Because we can't really dedicate spot. the time. Yeah, exactly. and this is the perfect yeah. time for bechamel to pour yourself a nice <laughs> warm cup of bechamel, bechamel in drink on the scoop Brooklyn style. <laughs> Just smell that so, hot New York garbage <laughs> air and sip your bechamel. Yeah. From the cup. <laughs> Let me get a bechamel on the rocks, so please. <laughs> Here's the, here's the punchline to, to Megan McGriddle here. Uh, again, everything revolves around food, n- and just the problems of the poor absolutely cannot be solved by any sort of redistribution of no, wealth because or she, property because in our society. As, as she would say, she'd say, I got, I got fewer kitchen gigas than I need, but less than I want. <laughs> here's the, here's the punchline. In the, in the same thread that, that kicked off talking about David Brooks, McGriddle says this. A lot of folks on the left are not familiar with work on social class that was considered foundational in my brief activist years. She continues, I went to college in the immediate post-communist world where we still fundamentally spoke the language of Marx. Today's left doesn't at all. Who do you know on the left? (laughs) What is she talking about? She is right. They don't speak in the language of Marx, but neither did yuppies. Well, I don't get what she means. I've been puzzling over that those tweets for two day, today now i don't know what she means i don't get what she's talking about i guess she's i think she is deci- she is so concretely identified class with social convention that in her mind when marx was talking about class he wasn't talking about you know someone 
a working class person being someone who had only their labor to sell. It was somebody who enjoyed F 150s and Nashville modern. Uh, she probably and remembers music. like reading Bourdieu and like. <laughs> And like thinks like, oh, well, I was I had a uh, I had, you know, Marxist culture analysis. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like I think that me. There's, yeah, she's basically she's taking sort of the Marxist cultural stuff from like the Frankfurt School and welding it. Dorno. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dorno. And, Dorno wel- pizza slicer. And, and welding it to like the material shift in the language of class that happened in the U.S. as a result of the neoliberal turn. Well, there was actually a purging of Marxists from the academy, but it happened way before Megan McFardle was in college. Right. But I think she's just basically saying that all the cultural writing that the Frankfurt School did proves that class is culture and nothing else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what she's saying. She sucks. God, she's awful. <laughs> yeah, read that. I, I mean, I only like it's it's like it's long, but check out the Megan McArdle holiday kitchen and gift that guide. insane litany she did. Like she's got a lot of money, you know, she's yeah, well yeah. off, but she's not even close to one of the richest people in this country. And if somebody like that who contributes that little is able to amass such a grotesque menagerie of completely superfluous spatulas items, <laughs> and thinking just. If you can countenance a world where half of the population lives on a dollar a day and she has 15 types of lemon zester, <laughs> then you are a fundamentally a sociopathic monster. Let the meat zest. Let the meat zest. Because if you don't see that disparity and get just physically fucking nauseous at the injustice of it, I don't want to fucking talk to you. Fuck off. Stick a fucking microplane up your ass. <laughs> Uh, she has an extra one just for that. Megan inspires. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Megan always inspires uh, such good work. Uh, it's true. She show. was. She is. I, I think Virgil said it best. I mean, her inability to mask to crushing banality and and monstrous uh, sadism at the core of her being and at the core of like libertarian nostrums is unique, and it makes her someone it's useful. Yeah, it, it, she's a teaching tool. She mm-hmm. every one of her things is just explo- ex perfectly expresses a fundamentally false notion undergirding the whole worldview. And so you can just point to it and you just see the structural elements and how faulty they are. The uh, Comprano uh, McArdle teaching tool can emulsify, (laughs) caramelize, (laughs) and enrage your Matt (laughs) Chrisman. (laughs) Saving you various tedious uh, reading tasks. (laughs) Yeah, I don't want to have to read the things. If they could just present it right to my face. <laughs> Only $70,000 a month. <laughs> I, again, I just like, I, I love the idea that, that Megan, through her holiday gift guides and Bloomberg View columns, is imparting the, the social cues that uh, working class and poor people need to, get, like she says, get the stuff they need. And by stuff they need, she means health care, housing, and education. Child care, yeah. elder me- care. She actually means the uh, Lad Magazine stuff. <laughs> Just to get all those boobs. <laughs> Eating bacon in a Ferrari. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, one, more, one more tedious reading. Yes. Hell yeah. Can I torture you with one more yeah, tedious reading? Like I said, I, I referenced this at the beginning of the show when we were talking about... Uh, just the alpha Trump family and, and just how... How cool they are. How, how cool they are, how strong they are, and just how, like, it, it, we're defending the West. Like, the West is back, baby. Yeah. The West is the best. Uh, you know, just no need to apologize anymore. Deus N- Volt, baby. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Donald Trump is the mouthpiece. Western chauvinism is back. It's yeah. good again. Yeah. Uh, uh, Teutonic wolf howl. <laughs> and uh, just like the, uh, the sort of the, the, the weird uh, thing now on the... On the pro-Trump right, not the anti-Trump right, who, again, has or made... Or as Gene here would call them, the anti-anti-Trump right. Yeah, like the, 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 the sort of people who find Trump distasteful, but essentially they agree with everything yeah. he represents and all of the policies that he's implementing, yes. but they don't like him personally. Yeah, I, I really think and that are, are, is, are just is, hedging their bets on when his administration inevitably implodes yeah. and it's tainted the conservative movement yeah. with it. Yeah, like, somehow I think, they get a reward for leading up to this guy. Yeah, and for, now we've, we've talked before about how... Like the the never Trump guys who are now the anti anti Trump guys yeah. are a very specific brand of nerd and cuck. oh god bow tie however 
the pro-Trump intellectual right is Ooh. even more intensely dorky, Ooh. like way more bow tie, like yeah. bow tie at a level that is. Their well, bow ties got bow ties. It's yeah. because it's because for the anti anti Trumper, there there is really no disparity between their dickless wan worldview and their just sad dorky presentation. But for the vociferously pro Trump intellectual, the difference between your like embraced ideal of masculinity and yourself is so obvious and stark that it makes them even it's like how you know like a short guy with a big dick or the dick looks bigger you know it's like I yeah, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah the anti anti trump guys that, the that anti- doesn't work for yeah, anyone I know, whatever the <laughs> anti anti trump guys want to be buckley which is like an attainable goal attainable fitness goal for anyone <laughs> But the, just slice off your lips yeah. and uh, wasting just go, disease. Go into, your, go into your doctor and demand to be deboned. Uh, <laughs> but the the pro Trump the pro Trump writer guys they literally think they are Charles Martel. Yeah, and they've like they will die if they're in sunlight for like twenty <laughs> minutes too long. Now I found the perfect example of this uh, this week in a uh, a publication called American Greatness. That is like it, it's this weird clique yeah. of like guys at Stanford who have their their, their intellectual journal that's staunchly pro Trump and like Victor Davis Hansen writes for it. They and, get uh, bullied by the uh, Scholastic Bowl team. <laughs> <laughs> it's really we should read it more because it is such a fascinating project. A bunch of like total nerds who are very self conscious about presenting themselves as smart eggheads, trying to do the mental gymnastics to make you know demented nitwit Donald Trump look like an. <laughs> The guy who literally is like wearing a diaper. The you can guy see that will him. make fun of you yeah. for your many melanomas, which yeah. I'm sure they all have. Uh, so, so the guy who wrote this article, the title of the article is Donald Trump as Pericles, which is just so <laughs> fucking good. And it's written by this guy, Roger Kimball. Google image the search yeah. him right now. Kimball. <laughs> Kimball. The, Give the people air. Yeah. Pericles. <laughs> so Donald Trump. And yeah, Google image search Roger Kimball and you'll get what I'm talking about, how the, how the pro-Trump intellectuals are even more insufferably dorky. Um, so he goes, and he's talking about the speech Donald Trump uh, gave in Poland last week. Yeah, all the all the all the alt right guys came at that. Yeah, stuff. they really love it. It was like a pure neocon speech. It just shows how fucking stupid. Yeah, but they talked about are. how Western civilization is good, and which that's is all they like George W. Bush did that. That was that's like half true. of his post facto rationalization for Iraq was that Western values should be imparted on people. So these people are so fucking stupid. They're incredibly cheap dates. They're you, yeah. If like yeah, if fucking Elliot Cohn walked out there and was like a uh, top cack, they'd be like, "Duh, ah, ah, he's so cool." <laughs> fucking idiots, morons. So I just want to read from a little bit from uh, the Journal of American Greatness, a project of the Center for American Greatness. <laughs> and sorry, I just yeah. sorry, the other website. There's a tab called the Greatness Agenda. That's maybe worth looking into <laughs> later. Type so, in type in code word great on fleshlight.com. <laughs> So here, here's Roger Kimball, and he, said, he writes here, I have no idea who wrote the rousing speech that Donald Trump delivered Thursday in Warsaw, but I think I know who might have provided a model, Pericles of Athens. <laughs> that's, sure. that's the plural of perennium, again, just for those listening. As I noted yesterday, the speech contained the usual quota of diplomacy speak, freshened up with numerous specific advisories, blah, blah, blah. As I also noted, however, the real meat of the speech came about three quarters of the way through when Trump mm. mounted the hot, throbbing a meat. wide-ranging and spirited defense of core Western values and achievements. And this speech was where? In Warsaw. Right. So what they heard was, you know the Reich will cease Krakow again. Like, that's basically the... That was a, that was a core achievement. Yeah. I mean, there. that's that's the... I think it's imagery. So, Roger, uh, uh, Mr. Kimball says, it's not just that we are rich and powerful, it is also that we cherish such enabling civilizational values as individual liberty, the rule of law, the political equality of women, religious freedom, and a generous, innovative spirit of curiosity and exploration. I love this because doesn't that that cuts against Trump's other fan base, which is the the Keck alt right guys. Yeah, they, with their defense of Western civilization certainly doesn't include religious freedom or political equality for women. No, I mean you saw Prison Paul yesterday. Prison Paul was like, Teen Vogue promotes anal sex, and we wonder why the terrorists hate us. It's like, yeah, you should just be a Salafist. You're already just a sexually frustrated dumbass in Birmingham. Imagine my surprise when their Mardi is hidden. It's <laughs> hidden because it doesn't exist. 
Imagine my surprise when I enter a refuted temple and they're crawling around the floor like snakes worshipping fire. <laughs> I don't know anything actually about this speech. I figured just people went bonkers over it because yeah. he was in Poland. He's, no, it was he just goes, like, oh, those he was are going super like, white uh, people. West, the West, folks, it's the best one yeah. of all the four <laughs> coordinates. You can't beat it. <laughs> North, pretty good. Santa lives there, can't beat him. <laughs> Personal <laughs> friend. Genius. Personal friend. Uh, no, th- this is this is from this speech. He says, "Folks, I picked out. I picked out. I, I picked out Rudolph. I said that's the winner." So fucking good. This is what this is. This is actually I'm quoting from the speech now, Amber. He, this is what he writes. Uh, we write symphonies. We pursue innovation. We celebrate our ancient heroes. Embrace our timeless traditions and customs, and always seek to explore and discover brand new frontiers. What's that America what's doesn't what? have yeah. ancient heroes. Yeah, not we're too human. timeless customs. <laughs> yeah. well, what when you meet a woman? You put her your hand out. You grab the pussy. Yeah. That timeless no, tradition. Well, well, honoring like ancient heroes. I think China's pretty good at yeah. that tradition. Yeah. Well, you know, but, he's talking about the West. He's talking about America, aka the West. AKA Athens, AKA Jerusalem, AKA Charles Martel, and, and that, thing, know, that thing we we write symphonies. Charlemagne. That yeah. is a huge uh, wink to these fucking proud boy dipshits who are obsessed with the achievements of white civilization, which of course they had zero to do with. But yeah. they decide, you know what? A and Beethoven also snipe, the only that was people. Me. That's the other thing. The only people who are like, uh, you know, like actually being like, oh well, the symphony and the ballet and the opera are like. Queers yeah. like us. Yeah, but they just want to take credit for it. It's like, yeah, yeah, Mona Lisa, that was me. They want to take credit for it and distract from the fact that if we're talking about American culture specifically, most of like the heritage and tradition of our music was created almost entirely by black people. Yeah, yeah. And every, I mean, what, every, what's, what's Donald Trump's favorite symphony, by the way? Like the score from Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> Like what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? All, all of the, all of he the loves tradition. John Williams. Sorry, all yeah. of the traditions that we would want to call genuinely American in food and uh, and entertainment or or music specifically, they're all due to subaltern peoples. Yeah, they're not yeah. the settlers. The settlers made shit. And like you yeah, know, yeah. and I don't want to be the, like the, the typical asshole who's like uh, yeah. rock and roll just stole everything from black music because it borrowed a lot from country and uh, bluegrass and you know Scotch Irish folk music as well. But guess what? They were also trash people. Who yeah, they're, 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 yeah. Pieces. <laughs> they're pieces of shit. Uh, I also, I mean, this is just like the the thing where it's like, oh, I'm a Western chauvinist. It's just like it's a new version of the people who are like. Yeah, I believe in reincarnation. I was actually a, I was actually a champion gladiator, and then <laughs> Alexander the Great in my past life. <laughs> yeah, like, that's exactly like you, yeah. yeah, like yeah, you, that's exactly what. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, yeah, if yeah, you, like if you like went brilliant. Like if you went back in time, like you you wouldn't. You're an IT guy now. You wouldn't have been a fucking dirt farmer back then. <laughs> you're not shit now. You wouldn't have been back then because it was even more unfair and arbitrary and fucked up then. And you're not an impressive person, but you think just by virtue of going into the past that you become everyone from the past that you know. Like if you go back Felix far enough, something incredibly deep. Like if you go back far enough, the only people that existed in Rome were Caesar yeah. and fucking Christ. You fucking <laughs> idiot. Yeah. No, there were millions of people like you. Who sucked? That's like uh, and you know, like died Ma- forgotten. That's like the uh, Mark Corrigan for joke on Peep Show, where he was just like, everyone thinks they're Napoleon. What about all the Chinese peasants? <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. All the Gavin, you, you know what Gavin McGinnis would have been in Rome? He would have just like made out a with prostitute. Another, yeah, he would have been a prostitute and like made out with their version of Milo, who actually was every man if you think about it. <laughs> and been like, oh, this is to own the Ostrogoths. No, no one would have given a shit. He would have, at best, I mean, as far as someone who had like you know like social standing but not actually a lot of power he would have been like I don't know like a very low tier merchant or a prostitute or something like he wouldn't be a slave but he certainly wouldn't be in charge of anything oh god no no No, he would be one of those guys and these people all want to like claim to western culture and they mean like high culture and it's I I know I don't see them at the ballet. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, but like the guys, the, the guys that the Romans would just like throw into the Colosseum just to get like torn in half by like disinterested baboons. Like that would be them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like let's see what happens if we put this guy in a sack with a Wolverine for an hour. Yeah, base. You think base stick man would be leading the charge in Gaul? <laughs> like, and here's the other the thing. Fuck out of here. And uh, the, the other thing here that I love about this is it also includes the great uh, sort of conservative intellectual tick of. You know, reading the classics and quoting them, which impresses, I don't know, high schoolers. So they have their audience in mind when they do this shit. But when they invoke like classical Athens and Rome, 
Dude, both of those societies were awful. They were Sorry. brutal they were just, and terrible. They were brutal, terrible, oppressive places. You, you, like, there were like five jobs, and you weren't going to get the one good one. Yeah, it's like it's you could use sort of a a, a version of uh, of like Raoul's veil of ignorance of like, okay, you think a society was great. Well, how enthusiastic would you be if I told you I'm going to snap my fingers and you are going to be randomly placed into the life of somebody from that uh, society? And if you say, fuck no, it was probably pretty shitty and there's nothing to be venerated. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what was the thing? Black people can't time travel. Uh, anything before 1985 yeah. is just completely unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, and anything before they broke up, like feudal ties and those sort of like rigid social roles, it sucked for basically everyone. everyone. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what is really worth left to read from uh, Roger Kimball here. Well, there's some description of him as like a, just like a ripped, yoked, like... No, okay. Oh, yeah, no, here he goes. He says, uh, he talks about how... Uh, wretched lefties like Peter Beinart castigated as evidence of his racial and religious paranoia. I mean, he is basically giving a blood and soil speech yeah. and talking about, you know, invaders uh, yeah. polluting our culture. Yeah. Couldn't see anything wrong with that. But uh, he also uses the phrase, it was the same throughout the gigantic and odiferous midden of progressive commentary. Can you just hear, like, the nasal voice writing that? Odiferous? Odiferous midden. It's like people who say, like, uh, like, you know, uh, when when their drinks come, mm, libations. Ugh, ugh. Ugh. Yeah, this article already walked. He's across, a lady guy. Yeah, this article already <laughs> walked across the room and said, "I doff my cap, my lady, to Amber." <laughs> yep. Exactly. So I, the, the one last thing I got to read from this that I think sums it up, and he goes, he quotes from Pericles' famous funeral oration. Again, by the way, Pericles. Uh, Plural of perennium. He got Athens involved in a disastrous and unnecessary war that basically ruined their entire culture and uh, shut the gates to the city during a plague that a lot of people also died from. He was basically a demagogue and an asshole. So I suppose it, the, and probably also child fucker. So the comparison holds up with Trump. Right, but there are there are there are beautiful busts and statuary of him. This is the last the thing I want to read from about. this. He says. Uh, it's a good thing that Pericles did not have to suffer under the scrutiny of the chestless, politically correct ditto heads that rule our media and educational system today. Or perhaps I should say, it's a good thing for them that they did not have to suffer under the frank and manly self-confidence of Pericles. <laughs> Listening to Donald Trump yesterday in Warsaw, however, I wonder whether the tide is going out on that brackish, self-infatuated, yet self-hating fraternity. I suspect it is. Good riddance. And uh, to that, I want to say, sashing across yeah, yeah. I just, I just like, I, I genuinely like this man. I genuinely feel bad if you like Donald Trump and have to keep defending him and creating ever more elaborate fantasies that he represents some kind of lost Western masculinity for all the reasons that I think we've outlined yeah, he, quite. I mean, it's just like you shouldn't have to try so hard. You should just be like, I like Donald Trump. He makes the people I dislike it's a angry. Dear Prudy. He's a troll. It's they, they start out with, look, look, I love Donald Trump. Yeah. If you have to say it, then there's something very weird going yeah, on. Yeah, just, just fucking strap in and enjoy the ride. You're triggering, yeah. you're triggering the snowflake. Congratulations. You don't have to create these sad, pathetic attempts at justifying why this bellowing oaf is your fucking, you know, it's, champion. It's, yeah. The um, shield just, of Achilles. Just enjoy the, just enjoy the ride. Uh, you strap it. It's like, it's like that video that they show it in, in Soylent Green before they euthanize you. <laughs> just watch it. Watch the pretty pictures. Uh, perchance, milady notices that uh, with the very courage of Achilles meets meets uh, the beauty of Athena, <laughs> that, the, that, the that the grandiose, uh, ex exalt exalted wit of such a man could rain down on his inferiors like the, like the, arrow, like the arrows of Ajax. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, someone will write that column, and then five minutes after it's being published, Trump will be photographed like giving a thumbs up next yeah. to a Big Mac, <laughs> yeah. or like you know, like. Oh, just, folks! Like, I just met Tracy Lord. <laughs> terrific. <laughs> I always wanted to fuck her. <laughs> yeah. You know, or like, yeah, or just, yeah, talking about uh, the wonderful chocolate cake he had yeah. on his golf course, or just be like... Clapping his hands like an infant uh, during fireworks. Be being <laughs> caught on a hot mic, like, you know, I, no one ever proved to me that Liberace was, uh, was gay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, 
Good luck uh, to them. Good luck to all that. Uh, yeah. Good luck to everyone. <laughs> good luck to all of us. We're going to fucking need it. No, I was going to say good luck to everyone who uh, was a duke in a past life when Western <laughs> yeah. civilization was strong. It was yeah. 90% dukes. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking you guys- of monarchy... Uh, I'm gonna be gone for the next two weeks. Oh, right. right. Oh, yeah. Right. And we'll, we'll, we'll show. I wanted to. Time, to, boys. Yes, time to kick up our feet. Ooh, and right. Right. Yeah, put the, the hands. <laughs> time to scratch ourselves openly. Hey guys, the uh, emperor's not gonna be here. Let's jerk off in front of each other. Like that was you. Let's just. Last one's gotta eat the biscuit. Hey guys, let's just kiss each other. No girls watching. <laughs> just like guys do. Uh, uh, just guy things. Yeah. yeah let's just, just guy all, stuff. Let's all sleep in a big bed like Willy Wonka. <laughs> Ever why, so wait, wh- oh, why, why are you going away? I miss you guys so much. Yeah, we're pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to the UK for um, for the next two weeks. <laughs> You're going to uh, go in a bloody Tesco around the corner. I'm going to be uh, talking to a lot of people from Momentum, uh, the organization that's very much behind the rise of Jeremy Corbyn. Um... And I'm going to be producing uh, a series, a few articles on the trip uh, for, for current affairs. So, you know, follow them on Twitter and watch for that. And I will be not returning to Twitter, but I will be sending Alex, our uh, uh, the current affairs um, Twitter god, uh, dispatches to tweet mm-hmm. at him. So in a way... I will be back on Twitter. Follow the Current Affairs account. Oh, you and run by loan option. Chip Very good. Eye. Mm-hmm. Oh, you and, can uh, have a chip eye. Perhaps. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll also take pictures that I'll have him send. So every Nando's oh, I go man. to, Legend. every Tesco, yes. you're going to see tweeted go, from oh, that account. I am for so Tesco jealous. Chag. I just, uh, w- when uh, Amber said I'm off to England, it reminded me of the biggest piece of shit I ever had for a professor. He was a world, my world religions professor in a city college in Chicago, and he had he had an affected English accent. He was like from Illinois, but he <laughs> he, he one day he opened class. He said, "We shan't be having class next week. I'm off to New York. I'm being sued." <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I, I was, and mic drop walked out. Didn't teach the rest of the semester. We all got A's. He was so. There was one time he was like talking with a girl in the front row, and he's like, "So you're wearing exercise pants? Where are you on your way to?" And she was like, <laughs> oh, "I'm going to yoga." And he went, oh, "You must be quite flexible." <laughs> I was like, new best friend, this he, guy. He's currently on the masthead of the Journal of American Greatness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he works directly under Stephen Miller, too. He works in the Trump White House. Yeah. He looked like David Thewlis? No, he looked, uh, he was like, he looked kind of like a portlier Steve Jobs, which made him cooler. <laughs> he was, I'm Every being woman's sued. <laughs> so cool. I'm All off right, guys. to New York. <laughs> what an asshole. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm off to the bathroom, but um, everybody follow the Current Affairs Twitter account for updates on Amber's uh, sojourn to England. <laughs> Till next time, guys. Bye. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>